Okay, let's see. We'll start out with a little discussion of the kinematic equations. I'm not going to do a whole lot with this other than to uh, show it to you. And uh, these equations describe objects in motion. You have uh, D represents uh, distance, V is velocity, and this little I subscript tells you that it's initial velocity, and then T is time. Uh, and then one half, well, one half is one half. A is acceleration, and T again is, uh, in this equation, is time squared. So each of these equations has a different uh, uh, use but they all come from the same place. And uh, if and when you get to a physics class, you'll probably uh, work with these quite a bit more. But that's what, uh, that's what describes what happens when objects fall, which is uh, kind of what we did with the center of gravity exercise. But I also wanted to call your attention to an interesting news story. And this goes back to Oh, when was it? January of uh, 2008. So a little over two years ago, there was a window washer. <coughs> and this fellow was working on a scaffold. Uh, I believe he was working with a partner, and he fell 47 floors. And it looks like he's going to, he's going to, uh, well, I haven't read the latest on him, but it appears that he, he lived, which was amazing in itself, but it looks like he's going to be able to walk and uh, lead a normal life. And the reason for his survival has to do with, uh, as he was falling, well, never mind that, that they weren't following proper safety procedures, but as he was falling, he uh, stayed with the scaffold that they had been working on, and that the, the wind resistance from that uh, added enough uh, deceleration. It slowed down his descent enough and absorbed some of the impact that uh, he was able to survive. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very lucky to have fallen that distance and been able to essentially <coughs> not walk away from it, but, uh, but survive. So that's kind of an interesting thing if you want to do some more research into that. Uh, to kind of recap the center of gravity exercise that we did before, we found it using that physics program simply by uh, moving our, our virtual rope until the load appeared to be balanced. And of course by now I'm sure you figured out that the reason that it didn't balance right in the center where you expected it was because the, uh, the load had uh, different densities. I think I put wood and I tied it to steel or something like that. So one side was much lighter than the other side. But if you have a, an object like this and you want to find the, the center of gravity, you can simply uh, make an X. Oops. You can make an X and then, in this case, the X is going to be right about in the center, assuming that it's uniform density, and that's where you would expect the center of gravity to be. So you would want to lift above that, directly above it, <coughs> to get the most stable uh, stable lift. You have an irregular uh, load that you're trying to find the center of gravity of. You can, uh, and again, we're assuming that it's uniform density throughout. You can suspend it, and then you have a straight line that you draw from where it's suspended, and then suspend it from another, another corner. What they've done here is they've, they've connected to this, and then where those two lines, and then draw another straight line, and then where those two lines come together, that would be the center of gravity. So if you, if you were to lay that down and lift, that's where you would want to lift the boat. <coughs> Here's another example where you have two, you have this L-shaped thing. Uh, you do the same, you do the X trick on both of these. This would be the center of gravity for this part of it, and this would be for this part of it. And then you go one step further, and you draw a line from this center of gravity to 
this center of gravity. <coughs> and then you go up here and you draw, you find the center of gravity for this part of the, in other words, you, you change your, um, your shape. So you would find the center of gravity for, for this long section on the bottom and this shorter section up here. And then you would draw a line from the center of gravity for this one and then for this. So this would be approximately the center of gravity for this. And we could try this in, uh, using that physics simulation. But, uh, and this is something that's not in the textbook. It's just uh, an interesting way to find center of gravity that I uh, stumbled across on the web. So to kind of back up a little bit and maybe run over some information we've already discussed, uh, briefly we'll talk about slings. And uh, I think by now you've got the idea the purpose of a sling is just to uh, act as kind of a connection between the, uh, the hoist and the, and the load itself. And the parts that make it up are the hooks, coupling links, fittings, sling legs. And usually, uh, in a lot of cases, these come pre-assembled as a unit. But you can put them together on site if you have to. Uh, but you always have to make sure to uh, adhere to the, to the weakest link theorem that the sling is only going to be as strong as the weakest component in the system. It can be made out of various materials, wire rope, which uh, we talk more about wire rope in the next uh, chapter, welded link chain, natural and synthetic rope, webbing, metal mesh. And then uh, proper practice and inspection are essential. And that little exercise I had you look into with the crane accident, apparently there were, uh, there were more, there was more than one crane accident around that time period. But the one I was most interested in was the one that was caused by a, by a, uh, a a synthetic sling that had not been properly inspected. And as a consequence, it caused uh, several people to be killed, millions and millions of dollars worth of damage, not to mention the lawsuits that will uh, come about as a result of that, uh, that little error of saying, oh, well, that sling is, uh, it worked yesterday. It'll probably work today, even though it looks a little bit warm. So that's just an example of how little, uh, a little bit of uh, caution can go a long way. Different types of slings or hitches. The uh, basket hitch just wrapped around the load and it's shaped kind of like a basket. This is another type. You can see there might be a little problem here because this could conceivably slide back and forth as it's being lifted. You could help that a little bit by making a double basket. Provides more support. And then the one that uh, everybody's probably familiar with by now is the choker, Oops. which uh, which clamps which clamps the load in place uh, when it lifts it, and that can be useful. And then the double choker. If you want to have, uh, because if you used a single one here, you can see the potential for you would have to be exactly in the in the center of gravity, and there's an excellent chance that the load would start to teeter as you lift it. So the double choker gives you much much more control and stability. And then the bridle hitches. See the configuration there. You have a uh, a number of. wire ropes, in this case, coming off of a central uh, ring, which gives you a lot of, uh, a lot of stability. And then something as simple as a hook is still, uh, still has a fair amount of information about it. It's ubiquitous. That's just a word that means it's very common. We use big words occasionally to uh, remind ourselves we're in college. Uh, ubiquitous, very common. Heat treated, they're made out of the hooks, they're made out of heat treated carbon or alloy, <coughs> or alloy 
stainless steel. And then before they actually, what, what that does is that makes the metal, it gives it the characteristics so that instead of uh, breaking, if it's uh, overloaded, it'll noticeably bend or deform. So that's a uh, safety measure. If, uh, if you see a hook that's been deformed, and it'll be obvious, you'll, uh, you'll know that uh, you shouldn't use that. You never want to uh, weld attachments to a hook. That's, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. And then if the hook is, uh, has been deformed and you want to play blacksmith and heat it up to uh, hammer it back into shape, uh, that's a mistake because the process of making the hook involved uh, heat treating and heating it to reform it is going to simply weaken the hook further. And uh, these things aren't a lot of money in most cases, so much better to be safe than sorry. Some of the terminology here, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think there could be that much to it, but uh, threads, that's self-explanatory, neck, the shank, the heel, the back, the saddle or bowl, tip, and in this case you have a you have a latch here. So when you hook onto something, this latch is uh, going to be spring loaded, and it's going to keep that down there in the saddle, so that it doesn't fall out. If you're if you're lifting a heavy load, sometimes uh, there might be some bounce for any number of reasons, and if it bounces and there's no no latch there, nothing to hold the, uh, the sling, whatever's in this throat here in place, it could bounce right on out of there. Another solution, if you don't have a hook, you can mouse it. In this case, they've uh, bent, they bent the wire around there. And then there's special purpose hooks for different applications. If you just want to grab onto something, grab onto a rope, uh, have something like this. Uh, in this case, the opening is, is, is narrower than the, uh, the bowl down here. And a foundry hook, this would be something you might see carrying big buckets of molten metal, something like that. Pretty straightforward. They should only be used for their intended purpose. You should not exceed the raised load. You always want the load to be centered in the saddle. You don't want shocks. In other words, you don't uh, you don't want to uh, stop lowering a load suddenly or stop raising it suddenly because that could cause the load to bounce up and then down again, which could cause uh, all sorts of problems. And you always want to keep your body parts that you uh, are fond of away from the hook and the load. They should be inspected periodically and frequently. ANSI, American National Standards Institute. These are folks that come up with standards for just about everything, you name it. Uh, how big or how bright lights have to be, uh, stoplight sizes, uh, Sidewalk widths, um, the uh, height of uh, railings, things to do with the electrical. Uh, let's see, computer, computer uh, code, the way text messages are, uh, the way uh, characters are coded using uh, using binary uh, code. So they have they have standards for for hooks and then many other things. And if the uh, the throat is increased more than 15% of its uh, what it's supposed to be, or if it's worn more than 10% of the original dimension, with whatever dimension it is, if there's any cracks, next gouges, or if it's twisted in any way, that hook needs to be replaced. And then the, uh, the lab exercise I'm going to do is another uh, physics, and this, there's a little bit of overlap here with the safety class. So we're going to uh, use that physics simulation software to uh, look at what happens to a, a virtual man if he falls 
under different conditions. So that's what we'll be doing in class on, uh, well, Monday for the Council Bluff spoke, and uh, Wednesday for the, for the fellows from Clarinda.